Hi, Carl. Welcome. Can we get a sound check from you? It looks like you're still muted. I can unmute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just yep. Oh, no, it's all the time. Has to hit star three in it. Mm. Looks like they all are. Um, Do they all have trouble logging in. No, he Carl's right here. On the video. How's that? Oh, 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 oh there, there we go. go. We got you. Yeah, I finally found the place to punch. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. I mean, it's not a big deal, but if you do this for once every three or four months, then you remember how to do it every three or four months. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So, Sarah? Hello? Oh. Sarah, we're just waiting. There are three people who we are expecting. So, I don't know if you want to go ahead and get started or if you want to wait a few minutes. We only got three, three more uh, advisory yeah. committee members. Correct. So, we'll be missing a lot tonight then. Yeah. Uh, Yes, we will be missing a few. Waiting on. Um, we are waiting on Tom Newman, and we are waiting on. Let's just go. Sorry about that. Um. Well, this just went away on me. Oh, there's Roger. Hi, Roger. Yep, Roger Wilson. And who was our other one that we're waiting on? Uh, John Worthington, I believe, we're waiting on as well. He said he was going to join us. So, so right now that means we're waiting on Thomas Newman and John Worthington. We'll give him a couple of minutes. Okay. And Sarah, because we're having the meeting virtually, we do need to do a roll call vote for the attendance. And um, and Lee Paramore is going to um, handle that tonight. Okay, Lucky Lee. <laughs> we'll see. Hi, Everett. Are you, um, can we get a sound check for you, please? So, Everett Blake, we're just looking for a sound check. If you could just unmute yourself and, and say hi. Everett Blake, can you do a sound check for us? Hey, Everett, can you give us a sound check? We haven't been able to hear you yet.
All right. Who else have we been here for? Since I've been upstairs. John Ward, obviously, the other one. So, could this be our. Was he going to Oh, it's possible. Yeah. yeah. They have a sign number on your wire sheets. Uh, it only makes just the first. First few, but. Two, five, two. Hey, so John Worthington, we see that you're in the attendees list that you've called in and we're going to unmute you so that you can speak. So if you could just give us a sound check right now, that'd be great. Okay, can you hear me? Absolutely. Thank you so much. And we're just going to leave you unmuted. So if you could um, mute your phone um, on your end, that way we can just leave you unmuted on the on the meeting. If that works. Okay. Anybody, anybody can tell me how to unmute or, or to mute my phone? It's the iPhone. <laughs> it's what is it? Star three. Star three. Go to mute it. Star three. Yep. And if you if you don't have a lot of background noise, um, then it's usually not a problem. But you know, just for <laughs> just for your can sake, can you hear me now? Use it. Yep, we can, can you hear, hear me you. Now? Okay, it didn't work. I'm present. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, and Everett Blake, we have not heard from you yet. Could you just give us a quick sound check? I think Everett, I'm not sure that he's able to hear us. Can you type something in the chat maybe? At least we can know he's hearing us. <laughs> yeah. All right, so Lee and Sarah, that's everybody that we're expecting. And we're going to continue to work with Everett and see if we can figure out what's going on. Okay, thanks. So, according to my list, we have uh, six members in attendance and one Thomas Newman that we might be waiting for. Is that correct? Yeah, and I, I think we need to do a roll call, Sarah, just to make it official since it's virtual. Okay. So, I'll just go down the list if people want to respond with it, with present if you're here. Um, Heber Blake's at the top of the list, so I don't know if he can talk yet. I'll, I'll come back to him. I don't know if I can, do I need to put the roll call up? I can just record it here, but Keith Bruno is absent. Melissa Clark is absent. Thomas Newman, I don't think we got Thomas here. I mark him as absent. And Jonathan Worthington. Thank you. Del Martin. Here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dunbar. He's absent. Uh, Mr. Hacker. Present. Present. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Lane. Present. Thank you. Sarah Winslow. Present. And Roger Rollison. Present. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. I have seven present, so with Everett. Okay, thank you, Lee. I'm here now. You have a quorum. Okay. Thank you. And Everett said he was here. All right, I got him. You're official. Thank you. I'd like to call the meeting of the Northern Regional Advisory Committee to order. Uh, you have before you, I hope, the agenda. 
and we need, need to vote to approve the agenda as submitted by the division. Is there a motion to approve? So moved, Roger. Have a motion to approve, a second? Second, Everett. Second, Everett. All in favor, let it be known. Oh, you got to do roll call, never mind. <laughs> Turn it back to you, Lee. Okay, so I'm just going to go through the people who are present. Everett Blake. Aye. Um, Jonathan Worthington. Aye. Okay, thank you. Dale Martin. Aye. Okay. Carl Hacker. Aye. Jamie Lane. Aye. Sarah Winslow. Aye. Um, Roger Rillison. Aye. So we have six, four, and one abstention. Thank you. Moving on to the vote for the approval of the meeting minutes from October the 18th. I hope each of you have had time to read over those. I'd entertain a motion to approve or any corrections or changes to the minutes. Motion to approve, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. Is there a second to the motion? I second the motion, Carl Hacker. Thank you, Mr. Hacker. All in favor, we'll do a roll call vote. Okay, Everett Blake. Aye. Jonathan Worthington. Uh, John Worthington, aye. All right, thank you. Um, Dale Martin. Aye. Carl Hacker. Aye. Jamie Lang. Aye. Sarah Winslow. Aye. Roger Wilson. Aye. Okay. Unanimous. Pass. Thank you all. Thank you, Lee. Uh, I will turn it over to Laura relative to the 2023 annual advisory committee orientation presentation. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I'm going to be talking for a while. Um, so if at any point, Sarah, if people want to ask questions as I go, or if we want to wait till the end, I'm perfectly happy either way. So I'm happy if we're, if we don't, we don't have to set a rule right now, but just so you're aware, um, whatever works is fine with me. Um, and to begin, um, my first item is the orientation one, and I'm one, just going to one second, Laura, if, if okay. any of y'all are familiar with WebEx, if you'll please use the <laughs> raise your hand, if you have a question or want to make a comment and we'll get to you. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and just so everyone knows the raise your hand button, when you're looking at your screen, there are a row of participants usually on the right hand side. At the bottom of that participant list, there's a tiny little hand that's next to a megaphone that you can hit, and that's how you raise your hand, just so everyone's aware. Um, also, yelling out um, if Sarah's okay with that can also be functional <laughs> if you're having trouble with the hand raising. <laughs> That'll be fine. Okay, thank you, Sarah. All right. Um, so. Get my notes up. All right, so thank you, Sarah, again. Um, and as Sarah said, my name's Laura Klebanski, and I am the MFC liaison. Um, we actually don't have that many new members here, but I hope that um, in saying this, we, we have more new members on other um, advisory committees. And for those of you who have served for longer, it'll be interesting to get your feedback um, on this presentation. So, because we, um, since tonight's meeting is only two hours and um, we have other business to get to, this will be pretty brief orientation and it's primarily focused on the duties of the advisory committees. So, um, this is just a, this presentation is really just trying to sort of 
what the appetite of the new committee members to get them interested and sort of give them a taste of what this experience um, is going to be like. So, um, my goal again for tonight is just to begin um, what we will be, um, you know, doing sort of as the year goes on. So, while this is quick, um, I do want everyone to know, and hopefully you all um, mostly are aware that um, the MFC office staff are always available um, for questions or comments. We're available by phone, text, or email. Um, and that includes Paula Farnell, who is actually our new program assistant, um, who we're very happy to have. So it's me, Catherine Bloom, who's our rulemaking coordinator, Paula, and of, of course the um, commission attorney, who is um, Philip Reynolds. So with that, I'm gonna get started. If I can figure out how to make things work. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm not going to go into a huge history lesson, although I could because I've learned lots of interesting things recently. Um, <laughs> but I do want to very briefly touch on the fact that North Carolina is celebrating our 200th anniversary for fisheries management this year. So as you can and imagine, a lot has changed in those 200 years. Um, for our purposes today, I just wanted to mention two dates in history. So the first date is December of 1822. And it was at that time that the first fisheries legislation was passed here in North Carolina. So um, that was titled an act to prevent the destruction of oysters and other purposes. And just to drop that in history for you, um, in 1822, James Monroe was the fifth president of the United States. And the number of states had just increased at that time to 24 when Missouri um, was admitted the year uh, prior. So um, this was a very long time ago, um, and this legislation was passed prior to the Civil War that began in 1861, and also before the subsequent American Industrial Revolution, uh, which began in 1870. So you can see we've got a very long history of fisheries management in the state. Um, and this first legislation set gear restrictions, it established an oyster season, it created um, fines to deter non-resident oyster harvests, and it also prohibited the transport of oysters out of the state. So even way back in 1822, there were sort of beginning concerns about over-harvest of oysters, um, specifically by out-of-state fishermen. So from this early beginning, fisheries management in the state evolved from a focus on the single oyster fishery um, to many species and then to include regulation of what were the evolving commercial and recreational sectors. So this leads to the second point, which was 1997. Um, and this was the year the Fisheries Reform Act was passed and ushered into a new way of fisheries management in the state. So on the screen, you can see a quote here from the preamble of the Fisheries Reform Act, which says, um, the General Assembly recognizes the need to protect our coastal fishery resources and to balance the commercial and recreational interests through better management of these resources. So the Fisheries Reform Act was really a remarkable cooperative effort by legislators, fisheries management, scientists, and both recreational and commercial um, stakeholders. And it made many changes to the way that the state managed fisheries. Um, it did this by restructuring the Marine Fisheries Commission. Um, it mandated the development of fishery management and coastal habitat um, protection plans. And it implemented a new licensing system. So we're not going to jump into that full FRA here. Um, but what I do want to um, focus on is. There's a mouse next to my computer and I keep reaching for it, even though it's not connected to my computer. <laughs> so I apologize for that. So instead, I want to bring your attention to a single FRA statute, which is um, here on the screen. And this is NCAC 143B-289.57, which is the law that establishes the advisory committees. So I haven't included the text of the law here because it is pretty long. Um, however, as you can see from the title, this law includes the establishment, the membership, and the selection of the advisory committees. 
Um, and tonight, I'm just going to focus um, on that final noun in the list, which is the duties um, that this law describes. So I've pulled the duty language from the um, body of the law, and those are displayed um, here on the screen. So the first duty of the advisory committees is to assist the commission in the performance of its duties by reviewing all matters referred to the committee by the commission, and they shall make findings and recommendations on these matters. The second is that the standing committees may make findings and recommendations as to any matter related to its subject area, um, and the commission shall consider all findings and recommendations. So now that we've read that law, let's discuss what that actually looks like in action. So as I mentioned, mentioned earlier, the FRA mandated the establishment of the Marine Fisheries Commission and the two types of fishery management plans. So the fishery management plan and the coastal habitat protection plans. Um, so, both are described in statute, but they differ in their development and also their adoption. Um, the CHIP is actually a collaborative process with two other commissions within the Department of Environmental Quality, while the fishery management plans are solely under the authority of the Marine Fishery Commission. So, the majority of the actions undertaken by the Marine Fisheries Commission are associated with these management plan processes. So most uh, that what that means is that most of the action items that come before you are also associated with these same processes. So here on the screen, you can see um, what is basically a simplified representation of the FMP process. So the chip process is similar um, in that the MFC sends the draft document to you for review, um, but there are some differences that we won't go into now. So. Here, I've highlighted in orange the specific point at which the Commission sends draft FMPs to you, the advisory committees, um, and also to the general, Republic, Republic, the general public for review. So this is the point in the formal FMP process where you fulfill that first duty that we discussed, which is to review all matters referred by the Commission and to make findings and recommendations. Um, and so, while this represents that formal process by which you assist the commission, um, there are other opportunities for you to provide um, more informal feedback to the division staff and also to the commission um, as plans are being developed and also on other issues as they arise. So, for example, um, you'll receive updates on these items during your quarterly business meetings. Um, at which time you can ask questions and provide feedback. So an example of these other opportunities um, is tonight's informal opportunity for you to discuss and provide comment to the DMF lead biologist on the strike mullet supplement. So this is not an action item. There's no action item that needs to be addressed. It's just a general opportunity for you as advisors to hear the information and provide thoughts or feedback to staff. Um, so this leads and that leads to the second, the fulfillment of that second point. The second duty of the advisory committee, which again, you can see here that the standing committees may make findings and recommendations as to any matter related to its subject area and the commission shall consider all findings and recommendations. So, again, there's that formal process by which you assist them in their duties. There's also a more informal um, and certainly that's. Um, led by you, the advisors, um, who are the experts in the area. So, saying this one little bar in this process may not seem like a lot. Um, however, we currently have 13 FMPs, which are reviewed approximately every five years. And with the additional informal updates and discussions, um, and also with the various other items that the Commission can refer to the ACs, the advisory calendar um, can fill up very quickly. So to help coordinate the work at the commission, we've developed an NFC work plan. Um, so here on the screen is the work plan, which I know is impossible to read, um, but the point of seeing it and putting it up here is basically to let you know that it exists and also that it's available for you um, as a tool. So it's updated after each commission meeting and as part of the um, chairman's briefing materials for each meeting. 
So we use this as a tracking tool for monitoring the various work topics that the commission and the division are working on um, over approximately a two year period. So this can be very helpful if you're wondering, say, like when the clam and oyster FMP is going to be coming to you. Uh, this basically lays that out. It is subject to change based on whatever happens that can derail certain things or just have, you know, if something happens and we need to shift it by a meeting, that happens and that'll be reflected in all of the updates as they come out. So I do recommend that you review this document at least once a year as an advisory member. Um, so you have a sense of what might be coming for your review in the near future. Um, that way you can plan to say, listen to a discussion at the MFC meeting to help inform your discussion here at the AC. Um, many of the documents that the commission refers to you are the same documents that are released to them. So, um, for example, in the strike mullet amendment 2, we're expecting that to come back to the commission in August for approval for AC and public review. So, you know, in the summer, um, you know, prior to that August meeting, we'll release a draft FMP for the commission's review. And if you would like to, as a, as a AC member, you can start to look at that at that time and follow that process and hopefully. When that actually comes to your, what would be your October meeting, then you can be better prepared to have that discussion at that time. So, this is just 1 tool that's available on the website, um, but there's so much more um, that is available to you as advisory committee members and to all the public um, on the MFC website. So, this includes all of the MFC briefing materials, recordings of previous meetings. DMF review documents, including the annual FMP reviews and the big book, which is basically our enormous statistical report for the division that we put out every year. Um, and all of that is available for your review. And also, if you have questions, um, there are people's names plastered all over those documents for you to call. So um, we try to make that very transparent. So, I don't want to overwhelm um, at this point, but I do want you to know that you do have a plethora of resources that are available to you as advisors. Um, and that gets me to the MFC office. Okay, so as I said, there is a lot to cover. Um, and it can be overwhelming at times. So. Um, listed here are the members of the commission support staff. We're um, housed in the Marine Fishery Commission office, all except for the attorney. And that includes me, Laura Klebanski is the liaison, Paula Farnell, who's our program assistant, and then Catherine Bloom, who is our rulemaking coordinator. And we are part of our job is to be here for you to provide support so that you can do your job in assisting the commission. So, um, Philip Reynolds is the attorney for the commission. Um, he is present at all of the um, Marine Fishery Commission meetings. You typically see him sitting um, up next to the chairman. Um, and he can answer questions um, related to legal issues if that ever comes up. Um, I think a good way to think about me and Paula is basically as your um, MFC hosts, we basically are here to help guide you to whatever else you need. And that includes at the commission level and also with the Division of Marine Fisheries. So, um, with that, I am going to um, conclude this orientation presentation. Again, this is just the very tip of the iceberg, if you will. <laughs> um, and I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Are there any questions for Laura? I do not see any hands on my screen. Nor do I. Uh, just one comment uh, relative yep. to essentially the the charge relative to Fisheries Reform Act and the advisory committees. Um, it seems like over fairly recent history that um, we're at essentially says the commission shall consider all findings and recommendations of the advisory committees um, as, as kind of 
gone by the wayside in some ways. Um, I know as far as the Northern Advisory Committee, um, that we've lost some good members because they felt like the commission, even in our discussions, did not even consider recommendations that the advisory committee as a whole had. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Sarah. Any questions or comments from the committee? I see none, Laura. Okay. Hey, Sarah, um, Thomas Newman came online. Just let everybody know he's present. So just wanted to let him know we saw his acknowledgement okay. right here. Thanks. All right, so um, Sarah, underneath the um, orientation, I did want to um, talk about the uh, video that we sent out with your meeting materials for the stock assessment 101 presentation. Um, we did have, we do have our stock assessment. We actually have two stock assessment scientists with us tonight. Um, I don't know if everybody had a chance to review that video, um, but if you had any questions on that, this is a good time to talk about that as well. Thank you, Laura. I thought it was a very good uh, presentation. Uh, it was a, a good groundbreaking thing for those who weren't familiar with stock assessments. And I would ask if any committee members have any questions or comments relative to that. I don't see any hands and I don't hear anybody hollering. <laughs> Agree. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> so, um, just so everyone knows, if they do have a chance, if you didn't have a chance before the meeting, but if you go back and review that presentation, um, or as we go through and you begin to see um, stock assessments come out of the division, if you have any questions about those, um, we do have stock assessment scientists at the division who are, um, you know, available to answer questions or anything like that. So please feel free to reach out again. You can reach out to me or Paula and we can put you in touch with those with those staff members. And so, Sarah, would you like me to jump right into the MFC update? Yes, Laura, but I do have 1, 1 question. Um. I think we had talked about it at the last meeting briefly. Will will the MFC office be sending out any types of regular updates to the advisory committee? Um yeah. and and kind of information of new things that might be on the division's webpage? Yes, we will. And um I apologize for not getting one out before this meeting, but we, um, what we're planning to do is to follow up this meeting with an email that will have sort of upcoming events and also just materials that are available online. Um, for example, I think the, um, you know, tonight we're going to hear from the strike mullet, um, supplement for public comment. If anybody, you know, if there's any discussion around that and. We have um, a couple of documents that are always available online, but that we can supply the links to uh, the AC member so that that's, you know, we just get that on your radar so that you can look at it before it comes to you. That uh, I think the next thing that will come to you is Amendment 2, um, the draft document once that's completed. But um, yes, we are planning to send those out and you, sh you will be receiving one of those after these meetings um, as a follow up. And then the plan is to have those come out at least quarterly. I would like to have those come out monthly, um, but that is sort of a staff uh, staffing issue more than anything else. But they will come out as frequently as we can get them. Oh, another thing, Sarah, is that we recently um, have gotten a Division of Marine Fisheries 
um, social media. We've gotten permission to have our own social media. So one of the things we're going to be sending out once that comes online is the information about how to follow um, the uh, social media links for the division. And that will be um, focused on division and Marine Fishery Commission um, things that are coming out of the commission will be more focused in that social media. So if people, you know, if that's how you prefer to follow things, that will be available, I think, in February. Okay, thanks. That's great. Uh, I've yeah. enjoyed following some of the department stuff. I mean, and, and the focus they've had on division has been very good. Yeah. Thank you. We appreciate that. So you can see no questions, move on to the update. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to give you an update from the most recent MFC meeting, which was the November meeting. Um, and if you'll remember at your October meeting, we were still awaiting um, a final commissioner that was um, Sarah Gardner. She has now been sworn in. That happened at the October FinFish meeting prior to that meeting. So um, at the November meeting, we did have um, all seats filled. So that was nice to get that wrapped up. Um, I do have a number of items um, from the commission meeting. I'm going to start with um, joint rule or joint um, fishing water delineations issue. Um, so the commission discussed this issue. Um, it's a continuation of an issue that began way back in 2018, and it's related to the joint rules that are shared by the Marine Fisheries Commission and the Wildlife Resources Commission and the boundaries that establish the inland joint and coastal waters of the state. Um, so a memorandum of agreement was prepared over the summer by the MFC and the WRC staff. Um, that was the commission staff and the WRC commission staff. Um, and at the request of the chairman of both commissions in an effort to basically try to make progress on the issue. Um, the MFC did not vote to approve the MOA. However, they did request um, that the DMF staff reach out and continue to reach out to the WRC staff and work towards um, developing recommendations for how to move forward to address this issue. And we're going to be um, planning to follow up with the um, MFC um, as we work through that issue. Um, the commission also approved the full slate of nominees for the obligatory seats. Uh, the uh, obligatory seat for the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. So those nominees are now going to go to the Governor's Boards and Commission Office for consideration. And there were four nominees. They were Mike Blanton, Jess Hawkins, Thomas Newman, and Robert Rule. Um, the Commission also gave final approval on Amendment 2 of the Estuarine Strike Bass FMP. Um, this included maintaining the gillnet closure in the Noose and Tarpan River systems until 2024, um, at which time the division will evaluate the effectiveness of the harvest moratorium and the gillnet closure. Um, so if you'll recall, I think in October, I sort of um, gave you a bit of an update on this issue. Um, the estuarine striped bass um, discussion had largely been um, focused on those uh, gillnet closures in the New and Tarpan River. So that was a um, pretty contentious discussion. It had been um, tabled from the August meeting and they did take final action at the November meeting on the management from that plan. Uh, the commission gave approval of the goals and objectives for the development of Amendment 2 of the Strike Mullet FMP. Um, again, in October, we were in the scoping period for that. And so, um, if you'll recall, um, the staff leads came to speak with you um, and they were very appreciative of the feedback that they got from all of the advisory committees. That was, um, they felt like that was a really good conversation. So, they um, couldn't stay away and they are back tonight. Um, they um, are actually going to be discussing um, the supplement to Amendment 1. So the Commission approved option 2 for supplement A to Amendment 1 of the strike mullet FNP. Um, and so just as a reminder, the option was a seasonal closure 
Um, the uh, option that they selected was from November 7th to December 31st, which is estimated to result in a 22.1% reduction. Um, and so we do have um, Dan and Jeff with us tonight. And Dan and Jeff, I don't know if you want to come on and have, if you have anything to say, we are in the public comment period for this um, supplement A and for this option. So um, we can certainly talk about it if anyone has any comment they'd like to provide to the staff leads. Um, well, I uh, will certainly uh, answer any questions that the, the AC might have. Um, we didn't really prepare any presentation or anything. Uh, I guess that was recorded and available online. But if, if anybody yep. has questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Jamie. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, so I know that you know the commercial sector will miss out on their harvest from you know part of November and all of December for the upcoming year. Has there been any thought to shutting down the cast nuts on the rec side where they go cast for the finger mullets, which would eventually, you know, reach adulthood and, you know, be two to three pound mullets and they're just, you know, being wasted as little baby baits. Was there any talk of, you know, making that illegal possibly since the commercials are taking such a big hit for, I mean, essentially the best part of the mullet harvest? Yeah, so this supplement is is it, it's applicable to both the recreational and commercial sectors. So when the season closes in November through December for the commercial fishery, it would also close for the recreational fishery as well. Would there also be any consideration to at some point making that be, you know, a 24 seven thing where they couldn't catch the little finger mullets, you know, so that they could grow? Like, you know, we're shut out of the rivers where the mullet harvest would be while they're still there. I didn't know if, you know, it could be a 12 month shutdown on the cast nut finger mullet situation. Yeah, um, so, so when we develop amendment two, um, we're gonna explore all issues uh, related to sustainable harvest. So that would include, um, Seasonal closures, size limits, whatever it might be, uh, gear restrictions, whatever, whatever options there might be. Um, so harvest of finger mullet, like that'll, that'll definitely be something we would explore. Um, is it, is it something that is prohibiting all harvest on finger mullet? Is that something that you personally would be interested in us fleshing out further? You're, you're muted. Sorry. You're muted. Jamie. Yes. You were muted. Sorry, we didn't we weren't able to hear what you were saying. Oh, can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you now. Yeah, I was just saying, and not specifically, you know, just adding that to it, but just in general, the fact that, you know, we cut out a big part of the commercial season just, you know really quick, but we don't even have the trip tickets implemented on the rec side yet to see, you know, how many mullets are they taken out of the equation versus, you know, we have a very controlled fishery where most of the time when we mullet fish, it is, you set around a school of mullets, you harvest them, you know, they go to the market, it's very little waste. How many are being wasted when people want to go throw a cast net out to, you know, catch bait to then go catch other things or even try to catch strike bass in a closed area to waste those. I just, I would like to see how many are, I don't know how you can tell without trip tickets, but if we could get that implemented so that we would have a better picture of, you know, making the cuts where they need to be made. Yeah, I, I completely understand what you're saying. Um, so for the stock assessment that we did for Strike Mullet, we, uh, we used MRIP data for getting estimates of the recreational harvest of Strike Mullet. Um, while that data is pretty good, like it has a lot of, uh, there is a lot of concerns about it because most of the striped mullet that are used in the recreational fishery or caught in the recreational fishery, um, they're used as bait. So our samplers never really actually see those coming to the dock. 
Um, so when they're re getting those reports from the anglers when they're actually interviewing them, they don't differentiate between striped and white mullet. So that's a problem like right off the bat with getting those estimates. Um, we do have data based on a study that was conducted by the division that um, suggests that about 29% of the stripe of the mullet that are harvested in the recreational fishery are striped mullet. So that's what we used in the assessment. Um, our intention when we develop Amendment 2 is to put together an information paper that details like what information we have about the recreational fishery and where those data holes are um, that we that we need to work on getting filled. Um, and then we do, you know, we do plan to, you know, um, as we develop uh, that information paper and then other issue papers associated with the amendment, we do intend to explore um, what management measures might be realistic for the recreational fishery. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was just bringing it up because I knew sometime like this summer I would see people when we would go to the dock, they would be getting ready to go out, say, red drum fishing, and they would be like, well, we just did a little cast net ahead of time right here close by, and they'd have a good portion of a five-gallon bucket with little baby mullet that, you know, would grow up to be a significant harvest, but those will all get wasted because, you know, they were all either going to be used as bait or they would die before they could be returned. So that's just why I wanted to bring that up as a, a major source of waste. If When you think about the millions of people who might do that over the course of a year. Hi, uh, this is Jeff Dobbs. I just wanted to say that we did hear that concern echoed from fishermen during the scoping period, and we did uh, present those concerns to the commission when we were presenting the supplement to them. Any other questions from the committee? It's John more than I have one. Okay, go ahead, John. Impact on the effect that this is going to have if you do a close season in November and December to the recreational bait users and sellers? Um, so your question is, do we, do we have any estimates of uh, like what the impact of the recreational fishery or the recreational bait fishery and the recreational bait dealers, what, what would that be under this closure scenario? Was that your question? Uh, you cut. You were kind That's of breaking. Correct. Up. Okay. Can you hear me? All right. Yep, I got you. Um, so, so we know uh, that striped mullet are landed commercially um, and sold as bait during this period. Uh, the amount that is sold as bait, we don't really. I can't. I can't answer that question right now. That is certainly something that we'll explore um, when we develop our information paper as part of the amendment. Um, looking at the MRIP data that we do have about the m amount of mullet, striped mullet that are harvested during this closed period, uh, it's pretty uneven year to year. But again, I want to caveat that statement that you know our our estimates are are, are pretty uncertain from MRIP. Um, I can say in 2021 we didn't even have an estimate because we didn't observe any when we were doing sampling in 2020. It was about 2,500 fish that our that our estimate um, uh, suggests were were harvested in the recreational fishery. Um, finger mullet, anyway, like are are a popular bait for like flounder. So you're going to see a lot of those fish har harvested more during the flounder season. And since that has been drastically reduced, we've definitely seen um, those fish being harvested more frequently during those open months of the flounder season. Um, cut bait's a different story uh, because, you know, that's a that's a popular bait for a number of species. It's big red drum and then um, for a lot of species like fishing off the beach and stuff. And we have heard from a lot of stakeholders that, you know, I'm a I'm a shore fisherman. I fish during this time of year. And, you know, if if I can't use striped mullet, I, I, I'm going to have to find something else. And I don't know if I can. Um, so we do anticipate like this would this will have an impact on the recreational fishery, but the extent of that impact, we we just don't have an answer for that right now. That answer is the, the uh, 
most of the fall red drum season is October and November. So if you come up and cut November off, you, you've pretty much cut the season in half for using that bait. Hi, this is Jeff again. I just wanted to note that with a uh, receipt, you can possess a striped mullet purchased for bait uh, during that period of time. So uh, it's not that you can't have it at all. It's just you can't harvest it. Any other questions? Looks like Thomas Newman has one. Go ahead, Thomas. Yeah, I was kind of asking the kind of the same line of question. I was just, I was just wondering how the uh, the recreational fishermen were gonna how, well how, actually how to bait shops or are they gonna be able to like buy it and freeze it? I guess in advance from North Carolina fishermen. Um, that's my understanding right now. I I don't know if we have anyone from Marine Patrol. Uh, in the meeting today, but that's how it was explained to me. Okay, yeah, and I was also curious, like, uh, for instance, if if a recreational fisherman don't always know about these closures, uh, <laughs> how is marine fishers going to react if they find a, a, a recreational fisherman with a hundred finger mullets in a bucket during this closed period? They're going to get a ticket for every single finger mullet they've got in the bucket, or how, how is enforcement looking at that? If you know. That would be a question for enforcement. Unfortunately, I don't have a specific answer to that. I know that uh, generally speaking, a fisheries infraction, uh, fishermen are obligated to know the, the rules and the regulations for fisheries in which they're active in. I'll, I'll also add that prior to that closure, um, we haven't really discussed our outreach plan yet for for this closure, but that is something we'll we'll focus on is getting the word out that this closure is actually occurring. Yeah, it's just a couple of things I thought about after listening to the last MFC meeting. And yeah, I do know there's gonna be a tough closure for the commercial and it, it and a lot of commercial fishermen say it's kind of unjustified with the number of fish we've seen the last two seasons, but I know that data isn't in the record yet, but I think it's gonna be a conundrum with the uh, <laughs> recreational fishermen using bait. Someone might not even know what that it, it, what a strike mullet is, you know, when they catch it in the cast net. Thank you, Thomas. I just had a quick point of clarification. It will be uh, a closure for uh, all mullets. It won't just be for striped mullet. So there won't be any need for people to distinguish stripe versus white. The November 7th through December 31st closure was what percentage reduction? It was a 22.1% reduction, estimated reduction. And that would be from the terminal year, 2019. And I think it was you, Daniel, that said that 29% of the recreational harvest was striped mullet, so 71% is white mullet? That's right, yep. And and when we, I'll just add, um, when we did the stock assessment, uh, we did a number of sensitivity runs where we varied that number of the, the number of striped mullet that were harvested in the recreational fishery. Um, and it had very little impact on the results of the assessment. The current recreational bag limits, what? 200 mullet aggregate. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from committee? It, it looks like Everett's hands up. Okay, Everett, go ahead. I can't see it. I'm sorry. No problem. Um, just looking at the thought of, you know, when we talk about a targeted species, um, you, you wonder how many people running out and throwing a cast net 
to catch some quick bait will not consider that that's the species they're not targeting. They're fishing for something else. They're just throwing for bait. So they're not looking at striped mullet, white mullet, anything else. They're thinking of going catching something different. So I think when it comes time to do anything, we have to be very clear in the messaging. Um, so the the guy who's running out just to go, you know, catch some quick bait off his pier, then go fishing, like me and Moorhead, um, doesn't wind up in a world of hurt simply because he wasn't thinking about catching mullet. He's thinking about catching something completely different. I think that's a great point. I think outreach is going to be key, but uh, I appreciate that comment. And that's something we're definitely going to be thinking about in the next few months. Thank you. Anything else relative to mullet? Yes, John Worthington with another question. Go ahead. In the stock assessment, where did you do a majority of your sampling? I can answer that. So um, for the stock assessment, we use data from the commercial fishery as well as from an ind independent sampling program that we conduct in uh, the rivers, uh, Noose River, Pamlico River, Pungo River, um, in areas of the Pamlico Sound in Hyde County and in the uh, New River. None in the Croatan, Curry Tuck, or Albemarle Sound? Uh, no independent sampling from there was included, but all trip ticket landings throughout the state were used. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the committee? I had one more. Go ahead, Jamie. Well, I was wondering, I knew that they do the independent sampling study because I had talked to the biologist in Elizabeth City about it unrelated to striped mullet, but I think it was maybe about flounder or striped bass before. And he explained where they have basically when the experiment started decades ago, they basically follow the same protocol where they test it in several areas of that water body with the same style net, the same number of mashes deep, that sort of thing every single year and compare the number of fish that they catch every year to make a decision. But how much of a barren are the commercial trip ticket landings? Because it seems like every year now, when there's a stock assessment, there's a fishery of concern. But does it take into account that like, we're not allowed to harvest out of the Noose River or like the Pamlico River, and we have way more days a year we're not allowed to use certain gears and that sort of thing than say in the 1970s where of course, Lenin's were at an all time high. Does that, is there some mathematical correlation to the amount we are able to catch um, that is making it come back that every single stock basically seems like it always is of concern. And so both the rec and the commercial sectors have to, you know, suffer. So I, I can address the first part of your question about uh, commercial removals. They're not used in the um, abundance estimate, they're just used to calculate removals from the fishery uh, to in order for us to calculate our fishing mortality. So does the abundance only come from the independent sampling model? That's correct. Yeah, we're we're calculating abundance from the independent sampling, um, but we're also looking at uh, a, associated biological data from our independent sampling and the commercial fishery. So, the stock assessment is is putting together a bunch of different sources of information, and so we're looking at the length data from the commercial fishery and the the independent surveys. We're looking at the age data from those surveys and the commercial fishery. Um, we're looking at uh, like the sex ratio, like all of that information um, we're looking at. And then we look at the abundance from our independent sampling and we look at the removals from the commercial and recreational fishery. And that putting in, putting all that information together, that gets it gets us. Uh, that gives us a picture of the, the fishing mortality that's occurring on the stock and then also the the population abundance and 
I see um, one of our stock assessment scientists, uh, CJ Schlick, is is on the meeting as well, and um, she might be able to explain it better than me. I don't want to put her on the spot, but she did give you all that presentation that you listened to about stock assessment 101. So if she wants to jump in, she can feel free. So, Dan, this is Laura, um, another stock assessment scientist, and you're, you're absolutely right um, in what you said. <laughs> so, all the different pieces of data are used to characterize the stock together. Does that answer your, your question, Jamie, just to make sure? I think so. I just overall was wondering. I knew about the independent stock and when you read the stock assessment, there's tons and tons of data in there. I was just trying to figure out what each piece of the data, you know, plays a role in. Since it seems like a lot of things are coming back as negative results, you know, not good for yeah. both the rec or the commercial. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from committee members? I see no hands. Laura, is there any public comment? Um, I don't believe so. Nobody's here and nobody registered, correct? Yeah, so we have no public commenters tonight. Um, I do have just a, a, some items that might be helpful in planning your next meeting. Um, okay. It's just basically what's going to be coming up for the February meeting. Okay, good. Um, so, all right, thank you. Um, so, for February, the Marine Fisheries Commission meeting is being held um, February 22nd through the 24th. And it's being held in Newburn at the Double Tree um, there on the waterfront. So um, they're going to be discussing um, a couple of items. One is that the um, they've requested an update on a false albacore information paper. Um, that is basically to look at um, the status of that fishery, um, at, or at least as much as we know so far, and also. Um, just to look at possible solutions for either implementing um, management or if that's even a viable option. So that's going to be coming to the commission in February. Um, we're also going to be hearing from the spotted sea trout fishery um, biologists. They're going to be doing an overview of the fishery. Um, we are trying to get out in front of these FMPs to talk more with not only just the advisory committees, but also with the commission as we go through the development of these FMPs. So they're going to be providing just a general overview of the fishery. Um, and also uh, they're going to be discussing the upcoming scoping uh, meeting for the spotted sea trout. Um, in February, they're going to be um, they're going to hear an update on the blue crab FMP amendment three revision. And this plan is currently being revised to incorporate um, additional diamond pack terrapin excluder devices. Um, so uh, the shellfish and crustacean advisory committee are actually going to be hearing about this at their meeting next week, but um, it's part of the adaptive management that was built into this plan and the commission will be receiving an update on that process. Um, and then finally, the um, strike amendment, strike mullet amendment one supplement. Um, the commission are going to be reviewing the public comment, including the comments that we receive from you, the advisory committees, um, uh, before they do a final vote on approval of that plan. Um, and so the um, rulemaking, uh, we do have two rules that are going to be going for notice of tech, or excuse me, for final approval at the February meeting. Um, that's a, there's a marina's rule that impacts um, basically the approval of um, dilution of shellfish, of waters where people are taking shellfish near marinas. 
Um, and there's also the mutilated fin fish rule, which is being, um, which is going to be um, coming to for approval at that meeting as well. So there's um, there's not any big items that you're going to be um, discussing immediately after that meeting. But if any of this, especially the spotted sea trout, the scoping period is going to be coming up. So that's something to think about because um, that's going to be picking up speed as we go through the year. And that's it. That's it for me, Sarah. Thank you, Laura. I know our next meeting is scheduled to be in person and just Correct. kind of wondering um, any idea where our in person meetings might be located? Yes, and we can talk about that. So um, I thought uh, that the pre the last in person in October that we did um, that building in Dare County, the Dare County administrative building, that's a building that we um, can generally have access to. So if that works for this group, we will probably look at doing that again. And and if anyone has any comments or or suggestions for other locations, please let us know. Um, we're open to, you know, what's going to serve you guys best. Any comments for members will on say, locations? Sarah for Everett, um, Dare County is about as far away as you can get for me, um, and still keep me somewhere in the in the area. Um, since we're in Raleigh, um, I mean, we can make it. It's not that many meetings. But that one, uh, Washington was a whole lot easier for back then it was Dr. Rice, myself and another gentleman, um, the three of us coming from Raleigh. But if it's just me coming from Raleigh, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, I was going to kind of second Everett and I, I don't know where everybody lives at, but, uh, you know, Washington seems to be more of a central location for the northern advisor panel but I, I don't have everybody's addresses are we still allowed to do it virtually at this in-person meeting if we can't you know get to those locations um yes we're gonna have that option available thank you I mean, that's that's a so, great option I mean I think after 20 some odd years, I've still never turned in an expense report, but Dare County makes you actually want to think about it. All right, so it sounds like um, there's some preference for Washington. Is there anyone specifically opposed to that? I know in the past it kind of rotated between having it in Manio and Little Washington. Okay, and and if that that is certainly we can do that. I mean, I will be honest. Washington's easier for us because <laughs> we're here in Moorhead. So if that if that works for everyone, if everyone's happy with that, then we could plan to alternate. So that would be um, that would be April in Little Washington. And then we'd be in Dare County and Manio for the October meeting. And and Everett, um, like I said, we're planning to have the virtual option for all meetings. So if you for that Manio meeting, you could certainly participate virtually. Yeah, and, and you know, of course, if ever we want to have one in Moorhead, you know, I don't mind actually being able to walk to a meeting. Um, that would be real nice to walk from my house down there. I think Blake uh, or Everett just said he's hosting the next meeting. So, <laughs> hey, just kidding. That would be great. I just finished my two pieces. I will host a meeting on the end of the pier if that's what y'all want to do. <laughs> I know. All right, well, I know it. Ahead, Thomas brought up. I think it was at the last meeting when we were in Manio. Uh, any. Discussion or moving forward with at least once a year trying to have a joint meeting with 
the advisory committees? Um, that is in the works. So, no, we haven't made any progress on it. That so my thought is that the summer meeting would be sort of an ideal time for that. Um, but no, we haven't gotten that planned yet. On Everett's pier. On Everett's, yeah, on Everett's pier. <laughs> well, that's good. At least that is kind of some a discussion about it. Yeah, I, I will say this. We are having, um, like I said, we are celebrating 200 years. Um, we do have quite a few events planned throughout the year um, and especially in the summer. So this may be an opportunity to coincide with those events. Um, and so that's uh, likely what we're going to be looking at just so you're aware. Um, and in terms of the um, April meeting, I will go ahead and start working on Washington as the location and planning for a mania meeting in October. Um, and if if anyone has objections to that or feels strongly, please feel free to reach out to me and Paula. Okay, that sounds good. Any other comments from the committee? Anything else from the division? Not from us. Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion we adjourn, John Worthington. I'll second you, John. Thomas. Thomas Newman. Have a second by Thomas. Lee, you need a roll call for this? I don't know. We can certainly do one. Well, I mean, I don't see where we probably need one. I don't think we need one. We, we don't need one for this. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 I heard the majority. <laughs> thank you all very much. Yep, yep, thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. You too.